for us is getting our business, getting our, our second business up and running and leaving it to our children. And that way they don't have to worry about struggling in the future. That's that's excellent. That's excellent because you know so often we're not thinking about that next generation. And so yeah, that that's that's awesome. Love that. Anyone else? Correct. I think about, you know, yes, we work, but I want to make sure or we want to make sure that the business that we have is um good enough for them because when when I retire, I can't give them my job, but I can pass them the business on to them. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, you know, and you bring up you bring up a good point, Nikki, because what what we talk about we talk about the four pillars of intergenerational wealth transfer, and and those pillars are first of all having proper money management. That's talking about budgeting, credit, our debt. Um, you know, all those things, right? So so that, that kind of managing of the day-to-day -day finances, that's the first pillar. Because if, if, if we ain't got it, we can't pass it on anyway. The, the, second, the second is proper insurance and retirement planning, right? So having proper place, having those things in place that if we die there, you know, we're not leaving a family in a financial bind, we want to have enough money to retire again, because if we don't have those things to pass on, we have nothing to give, right? We have nothing to give. And then the third pillar is real estate, real estate. And so we believe that, you know, real estate is important, whether you are owning commercial or whether you own your own personal resident, because again, you can rent an apartment for your whole life and then you die and you you put all that money paid all that money in rent, guess what? There's nothing to go to the next generation. There's nothing there. And then to your point, that fourth pillar that we talk about is uh, business, right? As you mentioned, I can't pass on a job, but I can pass on a business. And what I tell people is, is just, we have to have that exit strategy in place uh, because our children, our, our uh, you know, beneficiaries or what have you, they may not want to run that business. And sometimes it's because they've seen us uh, through the years where we were grinding, building it up. And then the time comes and it's like, oh, I don't want any part of it. But owning a business and necessarily working in a business can be two different things because you can work, you can work in your business, you can work on your business, and then you can work above your business. And that's where you're not even on the organizational chart. You're just an owner. You, you are the one that's looking over Bill Gates, not on the organization chart anymore. So you you have those situations where you you you're above the business. So I love I love those points. Any anybody else have anything? Now, uh, Glenzy, if I I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. Correct me if I'm wrong. You you kind of brought some attention that I, I didn't mention before. I do also have a book, and it's Increase, Protect, and Dominate Your Money, and uh, Retire Financially Free. No debt, no taxes, no stress. And you talked about sleeping at night. You talked about being debt free. We believe that, that those are major components to uh, enjoying a healthy retirement and certainly uh, passing on generational wealth. Uh, anybody else before we kind of continue to move on? Hi, this is Jen. I have. Oh, go, ahead. go ahead, Jen. So I'm just going to echo what the ladies had said. I'm just feeling the same way. Um, whatever comes my way, I just want to know that I can handle it. You know, no stress, no, no desire to say, oh my gosh, how am I going to handle this? So we can just take care of it. That's what I'm looking forward towards retirement. But the words say a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. I have it's five grandbabies. Children's children, right. So in the, for his children's children. So I'm in the midst of trying to put things up for the kids simultaneously trying to work myself out of debt. I think our home will be paid for in about seven to eight years. I am 55, work for the government, stress the hell out right now. So <laughs> I need to get it together. So that's that's what I'm looking for is for financial security. All right. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, and, and it's on my screen is iPhone too. I think it was, 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 I'm not sure if the name was Jen or there was someone there. Go ahead. Yeah, it's Jen. Um, I guess I'm echoing kind of what 
a lot of a lot of others have said financial freedom for me would be the home that we currently live in paid off um no debt and able to go on at least three vacations per year in addition to that i would like to own we have three children and two grandchildren so i would like to own five rental properties free and clear and at first i thought these were far fetched until i realized that um i can get those properties not where i live but somewhere else where they're less expensive than where i live Absolutely. yet people are willing to pay a thousand to thirteen hundred dollars a month in rent and those properties would I would like for those to be in our children, you know, leave to our children and grandchildren if they want to go ahead and sell it or rent it or continue keeping it rented out, that would be fine. But at least they'll have that money coming in. So that to me is financial freedom and those are the goals. I'm just trying and trying and need help to see how I could go about doing that properly. Awesome. If that makes sense. That makes that makes perfect sense. Uh all right. Thank you all for sharing. Thank you all for sharing. So let's you know one of the things that one of the risks that really concern people is this one of the risks is outliving retirement funds as we've talked about. And you know that's one of life's major risks. And you know that's the number one worry of retirees is that they're going to outlive their retirement funds. And so what we want to do is we've been alluding to, you want to maintain your standard of living. Uh, you want to ensure a legacy for your family instead of debt. You want to protect your wealth. You want to create income for life. And when we think about retirement, that's really what we have to think about. We think about, we often talk about um, you know, risk and, and being diverse in our risk and that type of thing. And we could talk a little bit about that. I have, I have, um, you know, a little part pre, uh, pre-prepared for us to talk about risk, but it's not just risk of the stock market. It's just not risk of, uh, you know, losing our money, but you, you, we had to diversify in a number of things. We got to diversify in the tax treatment. Because that's what I find a lot of people do. One of the major things um, that a lot of my retirees tell me is like, why am I paying so much in taxes in retirement? I thought I'd be less taxes, but I'm, I'm paying more. The other thing is, um, you know, that lifetime income. Because one of the things that we, we, we have to figure out how we're going to do if, if, if my portfolio is, is mainly property, rental properties, how do I get the income out of the walls, right? If my income or my savings is wrapped up in my 401k, how do I get it out of the 401k in a way that I can ensure that it's not going to run out in my lifetime? So those are some of the things that we deal with in terms of how to protect yourself from those risks, untimely death, illnesses, those type of things, and outliving your, your uh, retirement are some major things there. Now, Here's here's the thing, and, and I may want to switch over a little bit here. We got time. Um, is what if we could take the risk out of the traditional investing? Because one of the things that happens to a lot of people is that when uh, everything's going well, it's going well, right? But when the bottom falls out, the bottom falls out. And so we have a strategy. One of our major strategies is this. Is, is how to be in a strategy that allows you for your money to go up when the market goes up, but when the market goes down, you don't lose any. So can you imagine if you could have your investment portfolio and eliminate all of the downturns, eliminate all of the, the losses in the market? That could be pretty major. Imagine how much more money you would have if you never had losses that you had to deal with. And it is possible. There is a strategy out there that allows you to do that. And many people are taking advantage of it. Um, and so, you know, I will go into that a little bit. Um, and let's see here. Uh, so finally, just a little bit again uh, about the education piece, right? So what we want to do is we want to educate people on, you know, how to protect themselves from financial crisis, you know, whether that's death, whether that's uh, sickness, whether that's the stock market crashing, uh, loss of jobs, those type of things. And then 
as it says, protect against market risk, long-term care. When we talk about retirement and we talk about generational wealth, needing long-term care or nursing home care can be a major roadblock in leaving that. And I don't know if anyone on the call tonight has ever experienced the spin down process. If anybody on the call knows what I'm speaking of, spin down process, please unmute and share if anyone out there has experienced that. Go ahead. I thought I heard someone. Okay. Well, let, let me explain it real quick. Um, the spin down process is if you ever needed nursing home care or at home care. Now, your regular medical insurance doesn't cover for that care, right? And even when you get into retirement age, your Medicare uh, doesn't cover it. It only covers a small portion, maybe 90 days or something like that. And so what happens is that it, it leaves many people to having to um, use Medicaid to cover those expenses. Well, the problem with the Medicaid, of course, is this, is that you got to spend down your assets first your home, your retirement accounts. You got to spend all of your own assets. Uh, and technically, or the reality is that most states uh, will only allow you to have $2,000 in your checking account in order to be to qualify to have that care paid for. Um, that means selling that, that family home, right? Some states will make you sell a home up front. Some states will let you keep the home, but then when that person who needs the care passes, you have to sell the home to pay them back. They have a lien on the home. And so it can be a pretty devastating process financially. And so that's one of the things we wanna show people how to avoid. Um, and if you've ever been through it, it's absolutely no fun, no fun at all. Emotionally, it's tough, right? Especially if it's a home that's been in your family for a number of years. Uh, the other thing is tax deferred growth. I mean, it, you can save yourself a lot of money by deferring taxes. Now we're not um, we're not all sold out on the tax deferred growth because it is what it is. It's it's deferred, right? So you don't pay the taxes now, but you're going to pay the taxes later. And you know we've fallen for that okie doke that we said, well, when I get in retirement, I'm going to be in a lower tax bracket. Well. I hope not to be, right? I hope I'm making the same amount of money or more than I'm making now. So I don't want to be in a lower tax bracket. And so that's a that's an important part. But when we combine those two together, tax deferred and tax advantage income, tax free income, um, now we're really kind of talking about where that can really increase your retirement, your savings by, you know, 30, 40%. And who knows what the tax bracket is going to be when we get to retirement. And again, we want to talk about supplementing your retirement, supplementing what you might have as a pension. Someone mentioned being a federal employee. So you have FERS, you have your annuity from the government, um, and then you supplement it with things like your TSP and those type of things. But how to utilize those things and uh, make it work for you. And then being flexible, whatever we want to do, we want it to have flexibility in terms of our contribution and also our access to cash and then leaving a legacy for the next generation. So um, let me just, I'm actually going to stop sharing right here because uh, I do want to pull up a different presentation, um, but let's entertain any questions that we might have at this point while I queue that up. Anyone have any questions, comments, like to share or ask? as we continue. All righty. All right. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to dig in a little bit. Um, I'm going to dig a little bit into one of the chapters in the book that I, I think will be that you guys will find uh, very educational. Um, 
and there's there's really seven chapters in the book. This is this is out of chapter two, actually, and it's some concepts that a lot of people have not heard of that I do want to share, and you can you know determine for yourself if it makes sense for you or if you have any questions. And so, really talking about the risk and rewards of the stock market. And, and how all that works. And we know that the stock market's up and down. And, you know, a lot of people are talking about, are we going to go into a recession and all these types of things? So chapter two of the book really kind of deals with how to protect yourself from the ups and downs of the stock market. And when we look at it, there's these risks that are involved with any type of investing, right? Particularly stock market. So you have opportunity costs. So if I'm putting my money into... Uh, a investment vehicle, that means I don't have that money to put into something else. So we always have to consider the opportunity cost. If I use this money for this and it's not available for something else, et cetera. And then one of the most important things is time horizon. Time horizon, what we're talking about there is when do I plan on using the money? Some of you may be five years from retirement. Some of you may be a year from retirement or even months versus the first young lady came on she was 20 years from retirement. So knowing when you're going to use the money, not necessarily the age, but when you are going to need to start using that money is important. What are your investment goals? You got to know what your goals are. Um, I always say, you know, we got to know, you know, where the money come from. What do you want the money to do it? When do you want it to happen? And then what is your risk tolerance? There are some people that don't mind taking a lot of risk. And then there's other people who said, listen, I, I don't want to risk this money. I want to, I want to keep it safe. And then, of course, the other thing is inflation rate. And because if we have an investment that's returning to us 2%, like a lot of the banks are offering, those type of things. But when inflation rate is, you know, over three, and then we know a year ago today, uh, the inflation rate was actually... Um, you know, over 7%. So all these are factors as we're looking at different types of investment uh, when we're talking about savings and retirement the same. So again, you got to evaluate your risk comfort level, you know, knowing where you are, identify the risk with each of the types of investment that you're considering, and then, you know, look at the potential rewards that can come with it. So here's what a risk is. Risk is the chance that your investment is not going to go as planned. It's the risk that you're going to lose money, that you might get stuck in a, in a trade or an investment and, and miss out on other opportunities. And typically what happens is the lower your risk, the lower the return. The higher the risk, the higher the potential for the return. And so when we think about what is risk tolerance, the risk tolerance is the amount of risk you feel comfortable taking, right? If it's low, um, high risk inv investments like Forex, uh, cryptocurrency, direct stock may not necessarily be the right investment for you. All right. And remember, risk is directly correlated with the return. Like I just said, the rule of thumb is I call it the sleep at night rule. So you want to choose an investment that won't keep you up all night worrying, right? So that's the main thing. And again, I, I like these questions when talking about risk and what you want to invest in. You got to think about where the money come from, from a couple of different reasons, right? Sometimes if we're inheriting money, like this was grandma's money, grandma left this money to me. I might be a little bit more conservative. I might be a little bit more concerned because grandma worked all her life. Mama worked all her life to get this money to me. I don't want to blow it. So I may be more conservative versus if I made this money from a side hustle, I won the lottery or whatever the case may be. I may be a little bit more risky with things that depending on where it came from. The other important thing is how do we treat it from a tax standpoint? Because if it's coming from a tax deferred um, tax qualified plan like a 401k, TSP, uh, 403B, those type of things, uh, we got to know how to treat it based on where it came from. And then the second question is, what do you want the money to do? What do you want the money to do? Do you want this money to live off of? Do you want it to, for a major purchase that's going to happen in five years or a year? 
or is it for retirement or is it for generational wealth? Or maybe it's a combination of those things. But knowing where the money came from and what you wanted the money to do is important. And then lastly, when do you want it to do it? So I want this money to be generational wealth. When I pass on, I want to pass. That's a different conversation than this is money I'm saving because I want to buy a car. So those are all important questions when we start thinking about risk and, and our investment and what we're going to be doing, how we're going to save, where we're going to save, all those types of things. Now, when we're talking about risk and rewards of the stock market in particular, um, as I mentioned, there's a direct correlation between return and risk. So as we look at this chart right here, what happens is the lower the risk, the lower the potential return. So in this case, you know, when we're looking at these green stacks here, right? So we got low risk, but we also have low return versus when we move over here to the red, we got a higher risk, but we also have the potential for a higher return. And so those things work hand in hand. And so what I explain and even explain in the book is this, is that there is a scale of one to 10. This is the example I use, kind of simplify this whole process because obviously we got different calculators and all these things that people can do. But if we look at risk on a scale of one to 10, one being the most conservative, 10 being the most risky, most people are not on extreme ends of both of those. You know, they're not extremely conservative, like, you know, they'd rather cut a hole in their mattress and keep the money. And most people aren't like, roll the dice. If I lose it, I don't care, whatever. I don't really care. Most of us are in this place where I call the movable middle, right? The movable middle. Those are, you know, people that are not at one extreme or the other. That's where most of us are. And we may toggle back and forth between those, uh, that movable middle, right? So when I'm younger, I might be more like on the eight. When I'm older and I need to use that money more soon, more season, uh, I might be more like the three or maybe, you know, where the money came from. But most of us is somewhere in, in the middle, somewhere in that movable middle. And we toggle back and forth, depending on the age, the situation, where the money come from, when we need to use it and all the those things that I talked about. All right, so let's look at some different types of investments and where they fall on that spectrum. So here we have, you know, high risk uh, items. And how this works when we're looking at this chart is the more conservative is to the right. So bonds is more conservative than stock. And so when we look at this, we're moving from low risk to higher risk as we move from um, right to left. If we move from yellow to red, we're going from less risk, less potential return to more risk. But all these items, stocks, mutual funds, variable annuities, um, bonds are all subject to mark market vitality, right? So if the market is volatile, things go up and down, you don't know, you know, what that looks like. And so that, the, all those things are on that spectrum. So that's the spectrum where market volatility doesn't necessarily bother us. The far, far out I go, the more less bothered I am about, you know, things going up and down. And then on the other side, we have principal protection products. So these are the types of investments where I know my principal is not going to go anywhere. I might, in some cases, give up a higher return for the safety of knowing that my money, I'm not going to lose my principal. And again, going from the most conservative to the inside to the more aggressive going outside. So you got fixed, you got cash, CDs, uh, fixed annuities, and then fixed index annuities. All these are principal protected products. Now, what's interesting is when we look at this fixed index annuities, fixed index strategy, those type of things, we can see that the return can be pretty high. So when we look at the stocks and we look at the fixed index strategy, really they can be pretty close to being the same. 
And so a fixed index annuity is a product in which we can take advantage of the market and things go up as the market goes up, but yet our principal is protected. And so for a lot of people, that is uh, that makes a lot of sense. And so I do a lot of talk about the fixed index strategy. It is one of the things that I think many people can uh, take advantage of. And, and let me just say this. Um, and many of you've heard this, you've heard your grandmother say it, your mother say it, you never put all your eggs in one basket anyway, right? You never put all your eggs in one basket. And so um, that's how that works. And then of course, um, you know, a lot of people are involved in, in cryptocurrency. It would be considered one of the riskier things like the stock cryptocurrencies, uh, whether we're talking Bitcoin or we're talking about other types of, of digital assets that's where it would fall on that end. So let me let me pause any questions or any thoughts about that. And, and, and here's, here's one question. What, when, when we think about this being a scale of one to 10, uh, put in the chat or come off mute if you wanna share, would you consider yourself, uh, where would you consider yourself on that scale of one to 10? So if, if, if I were to go back, uh, oh man, we're way back. Hang on. If I were to go back to this scale, uh, where would you put yourself? Would you put yourself as, uh, put it in the chat if you don't mind, put it in the chat. Would you consider yourself one, two, uh, nine, eight, or somewhere in the middle? It's always interesting to get an idea of where people see themselves. So for, you, my ret for my retirement, it's kind of like at a seven since I have supposedly 20 more years right perfect and 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 that's exactly um what i was saying is that depends on where you are and so we got some people that are saying uh we got uh all right we got four five four five two three right that's pretty conservative and we got seven six seven uh and we got four, five, three, right? And so e even as we're talking about that, um, you know, many of us are in that movable middle. That's where we are. So thank you for, for doing that. So again, um, looking at that from a risk standpoint. And so when we start to look at this, we break it down a little bit, you know, stocks, mutual funds, uh, those type of things. Again, you have a high potential for return. You have a high potential for um, for losses. So your risk is high. Your return potential return is high. The, on the other end of the spectrum, bank account, money market accounts, those type of things. You have a very low risk, but you also your return is low. And then in the middle here, uh, a great product is the fixed index strategy, where now what happens is you're kind of getting the best of both worlds. You're getting the market when it goes up, but you have very low risk when the market goes down. And this is kind of a historical look at the S&P 500, which I'm a big fan of. And as you can see, the market goes up and down, but look at the trend, the trend is up. Um, but you know, we had, we had three negative years in the early 2000s, 23% um, loss in 2002, in one year, and then 2008, the market crashed, lost 38% in one year. Um, and so this up and down doesn't feel real good. And if we were to put, play this on out into 2020, we see that it would start to be another, you know, another downturn. Uh, with the indexing strategy, what happens, um, and the, the other thing here is how long it takes to recover, right? Because if we look at 1999, we got three negative years. It took eight years to get back to the market where it was in 99. We stayed there for about 16 months, drops, takes another five years to get back. And so, and all of this, of course, was before this thing called COVID came along. Now, when we put in this indexing strategy, what happens is that you, you avoid the roller coaster ride, right? So when the market goes up, you go up, market goes down, you stay the same. So we get out here to 2007 and eight, the market drops, right? And, you know, by 38%, you just stay right where you are. Market starts to go back up, you start to go with it. And the fact is that you don't have these big holes that you have to dig out of. 
And so ultimately, in the long run, you know, that's going to that's going to play better for you. Um, so that's just kind of a, a, a just quick graph to reference. And uh, here's this guy, right? Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett to me is probably the gold of investing, right? So I know there's people who've made a lot of money, Jeff Bezos, others like that. Um, but as far as across the board investor, he's as good as they come. And he says that the number one rule in investing is to never lose money. Now, this is a guy that has billions and billions of dollars, right? So if he says he doesn't want to lose money, probably makes sense for us to kind of watch what we're doing as well. And, and so when they asked him this, the reporter was like, okay, cool. So if that's your number one rule, makes sense. What's number two? And many of you may have heard this. He said the number two rule is to never forget rule number one. And so that's really kind of how we approach things. And, and the reality is this, is if you have safe money, uh, you can then be more respective with other money. So if I have money that's safe, I know I'm going to be losing this for retirement, then it can allow me to be a little bit more speculative with other things. Here's a practical example. Again, S&P dropped 10%, 13%, 23%, 2000, 2001, 2002. And then with these indexing, these fixed indexing strategies, just showing a few of them there, zero. Because when the market goes down, you don't lose anything. 2008, the market drops 38%. With the indexing strategies, you don't lose anything. And so if we look at this over a 20-year average, the S&P 500 actually averaged not, not new money going in, but money that would have been sitting there during that 20 years averaged about a 4% return, where we got 10.2 over here. And again, the reason this works is because you're keeping you out of the red. If you never lose money, if you never get behind on the scoreboard, then you don't have to... You don't have to worry. Uh, you don't have to make up for the losses. You don't have to try to catch up in order to get ahead. So this is a concept that we use with quite a bit of the things that we do um, and that type of thing. So um, let, me, let me stop sharing here and um, just entertain any questions that anyone might have. I know we had a little earlier, we had some questions about social security, that type of thing. So um, let me just kind of answer that question for you in terms of social security, Monica. Um, what, what I believe taking your, your social security benefits at 62 can be very advantageous because here's my thing, is if you wait to 67 to take your social security, you're going to get fuller, you're going to get more, but there's no guarantee that, you know, that you're going to live or what the um, return is going to be, if they're going to reduce the, the, the social security benefit. We, we don't know. We don't know those things. So it is important, uh, I think, to look at all the circumstances. And if you could retire at 62 and take social security, that's great. And let, let me give you let me give you a social security hack real quick, especially uh -huh. for people who are married. Um, if you have one spouse that is older, you can have that spouse declare for social security and then freeze it. And then you can get a spousal benefit off of their social security, even though they're froze theirs and it's going to continue to grow. And so uh -huh. it's it's a method that a lot of people use to get social security benefits rolling earlier um, without necessarily, you know, taking your own benefit. So that, that works in certain situations. If you have a spouse that's older, um, that's over the social security age. So both of you have to be over 60. One would have to be over 62. And, and but that's a great hack to get some social security benefits without um, using your full benefit. Okay, thank you. Um, absolutely. Let's see what else we got in. All right. Uh, how do you invest in a fixed index strategy? Is there a brokerage fee? Uh, normally, those are not a brokerage fee because fixed index strategy is going to be attached to uh, one or two products. It's going to be either attached to a life insurance product um, that's going to give you death benefit 
um, critical illness, chronic illness, all those types of things. Now, the only fee that you have is the cost of your insurance. So even though there's not a brokerage fee like you have with a mutual fund 12B1 fee, but what you're getting in exchange for your fee is the life insurance coverage. Um, if we're looking at annuity, uh, generally speaking, you're not going to have any fees depending on what, um, what particular uh, choices that you make as far as investment strategies. Because within, within the life insurance or the annuity, an annuity could be a Roth, it could be an IRA, it can be a 403B, it could be a number of things, right? That's the IRS code. But the investment vehicle, the fixed index annuity inside of it, you'll have different choices. You might pick a S&P 500 index. You might pick um, one of the other indexes. Some of those indexes may have a small fee, might be 1% or half a percent or something like that. Generally speaking, I like the ones with no fees. All right, any, any other questions? Um, Let's see. Anyone else want to come off mute? You got one. You could uh, raise your hand or just come off mute because I see we have the man with us uh, that's going to uh, share a little bit of his experience. And uh, he's going to do a much better job of telling you about the wonderful things of BCG. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with it. Um, I did, I did, I did what I could a little bit there, JD. Uh, in your absence, tell them how wonderful group it is. Make sure they're part of the Facebook group and all that good stuff. And so, JD, how you doing, yes, sir? Can, can you hear me? I can hear you, bro. Uh, hey, man, I know you did. I know you, Tony, man. I know you did an excellent job, King. And thank you so much, man, for sharing um, all this pertinent information that I'm sure all of us um, um, are, are very receptive to. Um, I, I always tell everybody when we do these uh, uh, webinars that we do have a ulterior motive, an underlying ulterior motive outside of wanting um, us to become more financially knowledgeable. But with that financial knowledge, once you guys um, level up, then maybe you'll travel with us a little more. Or maybe you'll have so much money, you'll bring your friends with you on a trip. You'll treat them to a trip. So, but um, no, seriously, um, we really do um, want uh, particularly um, uh, our community to uh, increase the our, our financial um, knowledge and capacity. Because as you all know, many of us uh, grew up um, with, uh, I know I did, just grew up with parents who didn't, didn't know. Um, didn't know these things. Um, I was talking to my mother the other day about the, um, she, she kept telling me that how her, my grandmother always used to say, make sure, you know, um, you guys get life insurance. And she had life insurance on all the kids and everything. And she kept it up so that when um, my grandmother passed, we weren't, you know, looking around for the uh, GoFundMe and we weren't asking people my, you know, she had planned, she had planned accordingly. So um I just love the things that Tony and uh, Marlon do, and I just always want to want them to share um, their knowledge with us, so that we become uh, more financially um, stable, so that we can leave that legacy. I'm sure you probably had that conversation, Tony, just about legacy and leaving something behind when uh, um, the appointment does come. But thank you, uh, every. I want to thank everybody who who got on. Um, you know, we had a. Uh, I think. A uh, hundred and seventy RSVPs, and look who showed up. And that's normal for us, you know. If you're here tonight, you're so you were supposed to be here. You were supposed to get on here and get this information. So we appreciate you guys, and thank you, thank you again, Tony, for always showing up and showing out, man, with the uh, with the with the knowledge and the inf information. I am um, not only a uh, fan of Tony, but a, a um, I, uh, uh, I've been educated by him and moved some things around, uh, just according to his word. And it's been, um, it's been, it's been uh, very, very good. So thank you, man, for that as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so, um, I, I want to do something a little bit different tonight, um, to close us out. 
okay? Because mm -hmm. sometimes we're talking about these things and uh, if someone has any other questions, let's do that. But I wanna show you example of a retirement calculator and it shows you what you might need, okay? And so- Tony, I do have a question. Okay. Um, I have two questions. One, Jerome, um, for the New Year's Eve 2024 Black uh, Getaway, uh, the link is not working for the ticket. I'm trying to look and book the ticket or talk to my boyfriend about it, and the link is not working. The hotel link is working, but not the link for the actual ticket. Correct. Right. Mm -hmm. So just so just somebody else said somebody else said that two people told me that today, and I'm just I can't figure out what's going on because. We've seen tickets getting sold today. So I'm like, what is it that one person's not doing that the other person's not doing? Are, are you guys just hitting the, the link at the bottom of the uh Man, of the I hit every on... link, man, JD. I hit every, <laughs> link on the, every link on the page and I can't get to it. But uh, I just wanted huh. to tell you that. And Tony, I have a question for you. So you. in the, you're welcome. And yeah, try to get that fixed because I'm trying to get some tickets. Um, okay. <laughs> and Sony, so I, 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 previously I was told growing up, well, no one told me growing up, but reading financial books and learning, I was told that we would make less money in our retirement. So that's why like with the 401ks, we would then be taxed, you know, in the future, um, because our tax, we would be in a lower tax bracket. But just like you said, we're hoping, you said tonight, we're hoping to be in a higher tax bracket. So that wouldn't stand true anymore. So right now I have a 401k and two profit sharings and the new job I'm at has a Roth 401k, mm -hmm. which I've never heard of before, but I'm thinking to just start putting everything in that so that I have some kind of is it some kind of where they're taking the taxes out now instead of in the future? Right. That's yeah. what I yeah. do. Yeah, that that that's that's a great, great segue. There, there are you're seeing a lot of 401k Roths now. And um, you're right. I mean, we we were told that we would, you know, retire, be in a lower tax bracket. But you got to think about it. here's a number of things that happen when we retire. Number one is we can't we unless them grandkids is living with us we can't claim them like we did our kids right so so we don't have the we don't have the ex exemptions we don't have the number of exemptions anymore the other thing is you know our you know hopefully our home is paid for you got these things kind of happening and so most a lot of people end up in a higher tax bracket and and here's here's a, a good example let's just say you have a couple and this couples you know <laughs> doing life together, you know, my wife and I have been married 31 years, JD and Shelly been together forever, you know, we have, and, and, and you've been putting money aside in a 401k. So what you're doing is you're putting this money aside at a married filing joint tax rate. So it's saving you a married filing joint tax rate, the lowest tax bracket uh, on the scale. But then life happens and now you're a widow. And you're taking money out of your retirement. You're taking money out of your husband's retirement, your spouse's retirement. But guess what? Now you're not married anymore because you're a widow. So now you're paying taxes at a single tax rate. So you saved it at the lowest tax rate. But now when you take it out, you, you're taking it out at the highest tax rate. And so that's some of the things that kind of projects us into a higher tax rate in our retirement than we count it on. And, and so that's why doing things like the Roth, uh, we, we offer Roths, doing things like the cash value life insurance, doing things like your 401k Roth are important because then you pull some of that money out of being taxed. The other thing is that conversation about social security again, because if your taxable income, and it's called provisional income, is too high, like, and as a as a single person, it's about a mid thirty thousand a year. If it's over that amount, then up to eighty five percent of your Social Security benefits can be taxed. And so years ago, there was no taxes on your Social Security benefits, but now can you repeat that? Repeat that again. I'm sorry, the last part. Yeah. So if your income 
is over a certain amount, then up to 85% of your social security benefits can be taxed. And so uh, they tax you to get it and they tax it when they give it back to you. And so that stuff wasn't even in existed. There was no taxes on social security until the Reagan administration in the 80s. So now they're taxing your social security benefits when they give them back to you. Now, your income includes, for that calculation in particular, it includes any retirement income that you got other than tax-free, right? So it even includes your Roth. Doesn't include life insurance, but it does include Roth. It includes your 401k, your TSP, and also they include in that income amount to determine if your social security is gonna be taxable, a portion of your social security. So half of your social security also goes into that calculation. It's, it is as bad as it, I'm making it sound, it really is. So, um, but you know, those are the things that, that we don't necessarily count on. And you gotta think, you know, Roths haven't even been around that long um, but you definitely want to take advantage of some of that stuff. And we can, we can point you in the right direction. Um, now, the other thing I want to say, and I know I, I, I've gone on and on with this, but is when you start looking at doing a 401k Roth, you want to make sure, because if you're getting matched funds, normally, normally, almost 100% of the time, I haven't seen it any other way, Matching only occurs with the traditional Roth, traditional 401k, excuse me. So some company said, if you're not putting into the traditional, you don't get a match. Others say, okay, you can be putting into the match, right? You can be putting into the match or into the 401k Roth, but our match funds are going to go into the traditional 401k. So as an employer, they can only contribute to the traditional plan. So I know that was a whole lot for your question, but. No, it was, no, that was very helpful. Awesome. Uh, any, anyone else? I have a question. Go ahead. Um, how are we able to use or make an HSA um, part of our retirement plan? Okay. So a lot of people are talking about HSA being part of your retirement plan. And, and 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 it can be. So what happens is if you're putting money in your your HSA uh, is your health savings account. So if you have a high deductible plan, you can put money in your HSA. And if you don't use that money, then you can pull it out in retirement. Um, and so as it's growing, it's all income tax free. Now, if you pull it out after you're 59 and a half, you're not going to pay penalty on it. However, I do believe you would still end up having to pay taxes. So it can be used for retirement. It's all tax deferred. You don't pay any taxes on it while it's growing. But then when you do use it, I do believe that that some of that is taxable. So, but it what it happens is it just sits there and it grows until you get your retirement. Then you can use it without penalty. Cool. Anyone else? Because I would, I, I did want to jump on this sample. Let me do this really. Before you jump on that sample, uh huh. Mm -hmm. Just a one quick question. So, me listening to you, are you saying more so a Roth is as as a better way, a safer way to go yeah. than than the four hundred one k? I do believe it is. Yes. Yes. Okay. It it is. Is. I could have told you that, lady. Well, all right, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, the only the only thing with that, uh, and I love y'all, y'all, it's cool. Uh, the only <laughs> thing with that, again, if there's matching, because matching, you know, matching dollars, that's a hundred percent return, right? If I put in a hundred bucks, my employer puts in a hundred bucks. I mean, so you this is the advantage of the match. So this is not even with my employer because my employer is strictly 401k. I have, I got laid off some years ago. And so my 401k was pretty decent. I put it in a Roth. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. And so now what I'm doing is I have 401k with the company that I work for, but I take a certain amount that I save myself every year. And I don't want it just sitting in the savings account because I know it's not making any money. Right. So my put question it was, put it, put yeah. it in the Roth. Yeah. Okay. And by the way, um, the limitation to you making contributions to a Roth, uh, if, if you're under uh, 50, I believe, it's going to be 6,500 a year. Right. And if you're over 50, you have a catch-up provision. Um and that catch-up provision is to allow you to put up to seventy-five hundred in. Uh, so metric seventy-five hundred. Yep. So you can put okay. up to seventy-five hundred. Now, in order for the Roth to be tax-free, you know you got to have it open for at least five years, and you have to be fifty-nine right. and a half. So you have to meet both of those criteria. Right. So 50, 59 and a half, and what's the other criteria? And you have to have had it open for at least five years. Open five years. Okay, I'm close to that. Okay, I appreciate it. Absolutely, I um, got but, one over five year partner. What's that? All right, all right, got you. Hey, metric asked about TSP investments, G fund, F fund, L fund. I, I do think the the lifestyle funds that they do uh, in the TSP account is good. Um, uh, the G fund, uh, just the return is just so low. Um, and unfortunately, you know, that G fund is at the discretion of the president of Congress. So if they decide they want to use money out of that G fund, they could use it. And so, um, but I do like the lifestyle funds, you know, it's based on your age and they'll tell you the mix that you should take. Um, but again, I'll, I'll tell you, my opinion is only put up to your agency's match. The rest of the money you could be doing something else, cash value life insurance or or a retirement Roth or something, or even the even the the Roth TSP that you have available. So um so so I, I wanted to do just do this real quick calculator just to kind of show you um you know how how it works in terms of determining your income. So I, I'm just gonna plug in some numbers, right? Let's just say someone right now. Uh, what's a good amount? Let's let's say this is a 50-year-old. JD, let's say it's a 50-year-old uh, and they currently have how much in their account? What should I say, JD? 50, 100,000? You're muted. Hello? How about 150? 150. Nah, let's make it, make, it, make it 100. Let's, let's make it 100. Okay, 100,000. So they got a hundred thousand sitting in their account right now, right? And let's just say that's how much they make a year. They make a hundred grand a year. And inflation rate right now is about three point two percent. And let's just say they're contributing, um, you know, three percent. They're getting matched three percent, and we're getting we'll say a conservative five percent return. Uh, in that 401k with the ups and downs, all that. And this person is 50 years old and they're going to retire at 65. Okay. So this is kind of the parameters. And generally speaking, you should be anywhere from 80 to 85% of your current income for your retirement. So that's about, you know, $6,700 in this particular case. And then I'm going to leave the Social Security blank because it will automatically fill that in. Uh, zero from other investments. Annual return at retirement. You're going to be a little bit more conservative at retirement. And let's just say, you know, that's 3%. Because, again, now you're in retirement. You don't want to put it in something that you might lose money. So this is just after retirement. Right. And then... How many years, if you retire at 65, how many years you want to still be kicking? I'm thinking 25 years, right? At least, at least 20, 25. All right, 25 years. And let's just say you're going to be at the lowest tax bracket, 12%. So if we plug in these numbers and we hit calculate, um, this will tell us where we're at. So if a person has that 
hundred thousand. They're making a hundred thousand. They're they're putting money in. They're getting it matched. Um, and they need six thousand. We'll just round that up. Sixty seven hundred dollars. Based on these calculations, they would be getting fifty four hundred. So that means that they're going to be about twelve hundred dollars a month short in retirement. So what they need to do is they would need, if this person's 50 and they're gonna retire at 65, they need to save an additional $12,000 a year in order to be at that place for retirement. Now, we can do some things to help that by, you know, by doing things like the Roth, doing the cash value life insurance, doing some of these things. We can help that by, you know, make, having some of that income be tax-free, right? So that'll help the situation. The other thing that will help the situation is if we're in something that we don't have the up and downs of the market, some of those things can help kind of close that gap of what this person would have. And so this is just an example, um, just to kind of show you a little bit of what, what that might look like. Any thoughts, questions? Um, There's a question over in the chat. Okay. Uh, thanks, JD, because I didn't see it. Let me stop sharing so I can see the chat. All right, here we go. All right. Uh, I still see the same question about the TSP. Anything else? Okay. Oh, the TSP, you already answered that? Yeah, that's the one I answered. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So, okay, okay. so one of the things I did put in the chat, I put two things. Mm -hmm. One, I put a link to a form, myfinancialanalysis.com. And basically, if you complete that form, um, I will complete a couple things for you. Um, free of charge. Number one, sure. I will complete a retirement calculator for you. So you can see whether you're on time, uh, if you're short, how much you're short, those type of things. And then we could talk strategy that you could use at work or outside of work to kind of close that gap. The other report that you're gonna get is you're gonna get a debt elimination report. Cause again, uh, I can't remember who mentioned it earlier, but you know, being debt free in retirement, it can be a beautiful thing. Because you got to think about it. Even if we look at even even if we look at at house, for example, if if you have a eighteen hundred dollar month uh, house payment, you probably don't live in Atlanta, but or Charlotte. But if you have an eighteen hundred dollar house payment and it's gone when you retire, that creates eighteen hundred dollars of cash flow. Right. So, um, so being debt free. So what I will do is also put together a debt free um worksheet for you that will show you how you can be debt free by the time you retire or close to that and then the third thing is i always do uh, a analysis on how much life insurance you should have um take it into account what you already have um because you know many people have enough they don't need any more um so we we'll, i'll put together those three reports for you and i also put a link to my calendar, ipadappointment.com. So if you want to um, schedule a free consultation with me um, to go over that information, or even if you have other questions that we didn't get to tonight, you can do it. And then lastly, I'm gonna put in iPad Your Money, which is, uh, if you go to that ipadyourmoney.com, uh, you will see, uh, a book, a recap of my book launch, uh, where JD was one of the featured guest speakers. Um, so you'll see that there, but you'll also see where you can order, um, order the book. And the book is 1995. I'm putting a code in the, uh, in the chat as well. If you use that code iPad 50, you will actually save 50% off of that book. Oh, nice. nice. Thank you. Including, Appreciate that. 
and and you don't pay any shipping. That that includes everything. So it's a great book, it's a great book to have too. Great, great book. All right. Anything else? All right. I appreciate everybody uh, jumping on. Um, let's let's take advantage of those free reports and uh, let's go ahead and schedule. And um, I don't know, JD. This this is a good group tonight, man. Um, yeah, we look like yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Yeah, so so I will send the recording and and I'm sorry, I started the recording a few minutes late, but we got most of it. I'll, I'll start. I'll send the recording over to okay. Uh, yes, JD please. Tomorrow, and he'll he'll send it out to everybody who registered, and yes. um, those of you who stuck it out to the end. How many how many people we still got on here? What, what is Twenty five. Listen, 25 people, uh, the first 10 people that schedule appointment, you're going to get yourself a gift card tonight. You're going to get yourself How much? A gift How much card. is the gift card? 20, $25 gift card for Amazon. You know that half smile <laughs> shows your house all the time anyway. So if you schedule tonight, uh, the first, oh, man, people, thank the first you. 12 people that schedule thank appointment, uh, we're going to get you that gift card, right? We're going to oh, get you love, man. Thank, thank you, Tony. Appointment. Huh? Tony, so Tony, we could so Tony, we could schedule the appointment before we do the financial analysis. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, okay. You can schedule the appointment now. And as a matter of fact, I would so you could be in that first group. <laughs> <laughs> how many did you how many did you say? I said first 10. First, first 10. 10. Okay. That's two now now two, listen. that's two, two fifty. <laughs> <laughs> that's two fifty, right. <laughs> Now that you say Thank it, you, I, man. That's 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 listen, uh, that's, that's great. Uh, that's awesome. that's two fifty. That that's open till ten o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> if you if you schedule after ten o'clock tonight, that ain't gonna happen. All right. So, uh, Monica, uh, I don't know. We need to talk about it. I mean, we we have to see. We see how the numbers play out. Um, you 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 might be able to. And and one of the things you Monica was this. You said I might have to get me a little part time gig, right? And so yeah. you know that that a lot of people do that. But you know I'd rather retire and work part time than than on the grind. You know, just depends on what you do and how bad you want it and all that good stuff. So right, right, right. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Hey Tony, thank you so much. Thank you so much again. Um, I want to I want to make sure we do it again. Uh, probably let this uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas kind of get past us, but uh, come first of the year, um, I'd like to you know get back on this and see if we can get another. I know you got a lot of knowledge in a lot of areas. I think this is good, but uh, definitely would love to have you back again. Awesome, man. You know I love doing it. So it ain't nothing for me. Let's just put it on the calendar. Let's make it happen. And so. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for taking time Thank out. You guys, have, Thank you, everybody, for attending. Have a great night. Be safe out there. Thank you, guys. All right. God bless everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. it. Have Bye. a happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Have a Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Don't eat too much. Hey, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to see what we got. All right. Take care.